So we're supposed to speak today about how independent media covers international crises. But I think to begin, I would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention what happened in Tahrir last night, just a few hours ago, in fact. Uh, on Friday, there was the biggest protest in Tahrir since Hosni Mubarak stepped down on February 11th. Tens of thousands of Egyptians uh, from all walks of life filled Tahrir again. And they're calling for a number of things, but essentially for the ruling military generals that are controlling Egypt right now to honor the demands of the revolution. The two principal demands right now are for the prosecution of Hosni Mubarak, who is uh, sitting on the beach in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, relaxing. And another one is for some sort of civilian transitional council to be appointed to oversee these ruling generals who nobody chose to, put, to rule the country. So last night, they filled Tahrir. The army issued uh, an order for no military officers to join them. Very strict order under penalty of uh, jail. A few dozen uh, military officers disobeyed those orders and joined the protesters. They rallied, they chanted, as so many of you saw for those 18 days. They did that last night. And then a, a couple of thousand of them decided to spend the night and stay. And they, they were encouraged by these officers. And they set up tents, and these 2,000 people decided to stay to protect the officers. At about 3.20 AM, there's a curfew now in Egypt uh, every day from 2 to 5 AM. At about 3.20, about uh, a few thousand Egyptian special forces, military police, central state, state security forces, they came in with tanks and armored vehicles and they stormed the square. They fired live ammunition for about 40 minutes. Most of it was in the air to try and scare people, but they fired at buildings as well. At least two people are dead. Many hundreds are wounded. And I think it's important to remember that while there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this uprising on shows like Democracy Now! and, and uh, Jazeera English, but also on the TV, mainstream TV networks in this country, that this revolution is unfinished, the struggle is ongoing, and <clears throat> as American media outlets turn their focus elsewhere and continue to do this kind of parachute journalism where they just jump in to different crises and then forget about the story, independent media that's its strength, is that it continues to follow the story through. For Democracy Now!, there were three of us uh, who went to Egypt, myself, Hani Masood, and Anjali Kamat. And I think our coverage was unique for a number of reasons that are, are uh, endemic to independent media. And one of those is that the philosophy of Democracy Now! is to allow vo people's voices to be heard, to give voice to the voiceless. Uh, Juan Gonzalez, is the co-host of Democracy Now! is here as well, once told me, just listen to people. And so that's what we tried to do on Democracy Now! We just pointed the camera at people and said, why are you here? And you heard uh, in English, or you heard in Arabic, you heard men and women, uh, rich and poor, old and young, religious and secular, talk about their hopes, their dreams, what they're calling for, uh, their frustrations. What you saw in most of the U.S. corporate networks was a bird's eye view of Tahrir and a sea of people that looked like ants, and a lot of uh, pundits and analysts explaining why this was happening and why this mattered to the US or to Israel. And so I think that's the main difference uh, of our coverage. I arrived in, in, uh, in Tahrir on January 29th. The revolution started on the 25th. Uh, I was in uh, Park City, Utah, of all places, when it started, covering the Sundance Film Festival, of all things. Uh, which was a celebration of independent film. But I, I, like so many Egyptians, thought that this protest, which was planned to mark National Police Day on January 25th, would be like so many others before it, would be uh, a few dozen people surrounded by 10 times the number of very feared state and central security forces. They'd be beaten, they'd be dispersed, they'd be arrested, and it would be over. But I was very wrong. And for the first time in my life, I watched on TV from Park City, Utah, Egyptians take to the streets. I saw 
photos, um, footage of people tearing down billboards of Hossein Barak in public squares. This is something that was unthinkable uh, just, uh, just uh, three weeks ago, or before January 25th. And they were met with a lot of state violence, with a lot of tear gas, with a lot of batons, with live ammunition. But for the first time, all sectors of Egyptian society came together and they, they had had enough. And they battled uh, the interior security, the interior ministry's forces, and they won. And what they won was the streets. And that they changed the power structure in Egypt irrevocably in those days from the 25th to the 28th. And in Cairo, they won Tahrir, and they, they marched in uh, triumphant. And so I was, I was watching this on TV uh, going crazy. And I remember on Thursday, uh, before the so-called Day of Rage on the 28th on Friday, which is when they won the streets. My cousin Muhammad called me from Egypt. My cell phone rang, we had just finished the Democracy Now! broadcast, and he said, cousin, tomorrow we're going to overthrow the government. <laughs> so, and he said, I don't care what's going to happen to me, I don't care if I die, at least it'll be doing something worthy. And this is not a revolutionary activist. This is a successful movie producer. Uh, and so that's when I realized that I had to go home. But I arrived the day after the day of rage, by the time I made it back. And I went straight from the airport to Tahrir. And the first thing I saw was the party headquarters of the National Democratic Party, Hossein Barak's party, a blackened hollow shell that was still smoking. And I went into Tahrir and thousands of Egyptians were there. I'd never seen so many uh, of my brothers and sisters together in a public space except for at a soccer match because it's illegal in Egypt since we've been living under emergency law since 1981 to gather in a public space. And they were fearless and they were determined. And I remember I wrote down in my notepad, I said, this is not Hossein Barak's Egypt anymore and regardless of what happens, it will never be again. And that turned out to be true. Now one thing I think independent media is uh, our independent journalists are very good at is that they're very savvy about getting the story out. And one thing the Egyptian government did in a desperate bid to try and uh, quell these protests was to completely shut down communication networks. So on the 28th, they shut down the cell phone networks in Egypt, all three of them. And in a move that's unprecedented in world history, they shut down the internet completely to zero. So they cut Egypt off entirely from the digital world. Um, this did not have the effect that they wanted at all because I actually spoke to a number of people who weren't as active in protesting before and they said, oh, you know, I was going to stay at home and I was going to watch maybe on YouTube and check out Facebook and look at Twitter and see what was happening, but I couldn't, I couldn't even call my friends, so I hit the streets. <laughs> <laughs> but so this is the Cairo that I uh, descended to and it was very hard to get any word out. You can't use your cell phone. Uh, the only way to really do anything was to go home or go to a hotel and use a landline. But luckily, my US cell phone could text the US. So my, a very good friend of mine, Jeremy Scahill, who many of you know, who's I think our generation's best investigative journalist, got the idea, he said, give me your Twitter password. So I gave him my, my password and I just kept texting Jeremy from Tahrir and he would post it on Twitter. So these were some of the only tweets coming from Tahrir during those first few days when the internet was down. And because of that, and I wasn't writing Shakespeare or anything, it was just because it was the only updates that people could get, my Twitter number of Twitter followers went from 2,000 to 27,000. When the internet turned back on, my Gmail said, you have 17,000 new messages. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I think that uh, independent journalists are, are usually better at. Uh, we would file our pieces. Henny Masood, who was uh, the camera person working with me, TV producer, we would shoot all day in Tahrir and then compress our pieces and, and send them out via FTP. And you lose some quality when you do that. But I think we value, as independent media, we value content more than production value. And so we're willing to, to, to lose that quality. And so we would do that. And I, I, didn't, I wasn't watching the US TV networks, but I later found out that there was very little coverage from actually street level in the square talking to people. And so this is, this is another benefit from, from independent journalists. And I think a, a key thing as well is that 
we always talk about independent journalists, but we embrace community media. We embrace community voices. And I think the strength of democracy now uh, is that, is that I, I was Egyptian, Hani Masood is Egyptian, Anjali Kama lived in Cairo for two years and speaks fluent Arabic. When you're from the community, you, uh, I, I understood the language, I could walk with the protesters, I have a national ID card. Uh, I look like a protester and people will trust me and talk to me and it's very different and it became very dangerous in fact for Western journalists to even walk around. Um, and we saw that crackdown by the regime. The regime tried to uh, harass a lot of uh, Western journalists. But when we see this, uh, these conglomerates buying up all these community media outlets, what they're really doing is destroying a sense of understanding because community voices are, are essential to any kind of reporting, I think. And you know, when I, when I would go home, uh, I wouldn't go home to a hotel room with my, my media colleagues, I'd go home and I would hear what my grandmother had to say, what my, what my uncle had to say, what my cousins had to say, and that also helps understanding as well. And so community media, I think, is a, is a key point in all of this. Uh, let me just end on the, on the issue of, of social media uh, just briefly. A lot of people have been calling this the Facebook revolution. Uh, now, there's no question that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube were uh, key tools to this uprising. Egypt is ranked as number five in the number of users that use Facebook in the world. Um, now, I, I just think it's a, a very Western concept to, to call this a Facebook revolution. This is just a new, Twitter and Facebook and all the social media we are using, they're key. Uh, there was a 28-year-old businessman in Alexandria in June of 2010 called Khaled Said, who had allegedly posted some video of some police officers dividing up the spoils of a drug bust, money and drugs. He was in an internet cafe in Alexandria. They walked up to him. They told him to get up and come with them. He refused. They dragged him out. They took him to an alley and they beat his head against a wall until he died. The photos of his broken face uh, were taken by a cell phone and distributed by his brother on Facebook and they enraged Egyptians from all walks of society. Uh, there were protests around the country at the time. This was back in June. A Google executive in Dubai called Wael Ghunim, who's Egyptian, started anonymously a Facebook page called Kullena Khaled Said, which means we're all Khaled Said. This became the biggest uh, Facebook page uh, in Egypt, and he was the first to call for these protests on January 25th. We also saw on January 18th a young woman called Asma' Mahfouz who had been protesting for years, who had been arrested by police, who had been beaten, very bravely post a video of herself just speaking directly into the camera, challenging Egyptians to come out on January 25th, challenging men to join her uh, in standing up to Mubarak's regime, and that was key as well. So I'm not trying to downplay uh, social media, but just like the radio was once, uh, the newspaper was once, pamphlets were once, this is a networking tool. And to deny Egyptians years of struggle and organizing that really made this uprising happen, I think, uh, is incorrect. But um, I'll just leave it there. And, and, and just finally, on the, you know, the corporate media, I missed a lot of the coverage, but I was very happy to when I came back to learn that it was wall-to-wall -wall coverage. That uh, the Pew Center, I think, did a study that was the biggest international story covered on the US corporate network since the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Now, in the beginning, you would hear this false objectivity of, that's so endemic to our media, that, well, the protesters say this, but Hosni Mubarak says this, uh, and that's not journalism, that's called stenography, if you're just repeating what people are saying. When Journalists came under attack. Anderson Cooper was punched in the head in Tahrir. Uh, Christian Amanpour was attacked. I think you saw a change in, in Anderson Cooper's coverage. He started calling things as they are. He started saying, this is a pro-democracy movement. This is a peaceful, popular uprising that's being attacked with violence from a US-backed regime. That's what journalism is, calling things as they are. And I think that's what ind independent media is so good at. Thank you.